afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies, or ISIS for short, the High Commission of Pakistan and Singapore and Singapore Business Federation, I would like to warmly welcome you to today's seminar on Future Pakistan Business Today. To kick off the session, it is my pleasure to first invite Professor Tan Tayong, Director of ISS, to deliver the welcome remarks. Professor Tan. His Excellency Mr. Syed Hassan Javed, High Commissioner of Pakistan, Singapore, Mr. Yasin Anwar, Governor of the State Bank of Pakistan, Mr. Karan Singh Takrao, Chairman, Singapore Business Federation, South Asia Business Group, distinguished guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this seminar jointly organized by the Institute of South Asian Studies, the Pakistan High Commission in Singapore and the Singapore Business Federation. Let me begin with a bit of a pitch for the Institute of South Asian Studies for which I work. Now, those of you who are familiar with our work will know that ISS strives to provide scholarly insightful and objective analysis of current issues of importance in South Asia. In this vein, ISIS released two days ago three analyses on the state of Pakistan's political economy written by my distinguished colleague, uh, Mr. Shahid Javed Berki, uh, whom you'll be listening to a little later. Uh, but I'll try to steal a little bit of his thunder by uh, referring to the three pieces that he wrote recently. <coughs> Mr. Berkey asked in each of the three papers, with his characteristic incisive sharpness and intellectual honesty, which way is Pakistan heading? He said that this question, I quote, is important not only for the citizens of Pakistan, but also for the country's immediate neighbors. It is also important for the whole world, unquote. In the first two papers, Mr. Berkey provides a somber account of the difficulties faced by the country in political and economic terms. There are indeed difficulties on many fronts. However, just as Mr. Berkey is a hard-nosed economist, he is also a man of hope. So he reminds us that while it is important to see the negatives, it is just as important to identify and examine the positives, which, if incorporated effectively into public policy, can help the country regain some of the lost economic growth momentum in the last few years. So it is along this line that this seminar was conceived. This afternoon, we want to look at Pakistan from the perspectives of businesses and economic potentials, a story that is worth looking at in some details. Pakistan has, in economic terms, many things going for it. According to the World Bank's Doing Business 2011 report, Pakistan was ranked number three in South Asia for ease of doing business, just behind Maldives and Sri Lanka. It was ranked number two in the categories of getting credit, protecting investors, and trading across borders. Business regulations have been eased since 1999. Uh, most barriers to the flow of capital and international direct investment have been removed. Foreign investors do not face restrictions on the inflow of capital, an investment of up to 100% of equity participation is allowed in most sectors. This is in addition to the repatriation of profits, dividends, service fees, or capital. The government of Pakistan has granted numerous incentives to technology companies wishing to do business in the country, offering a combination of decade-plus tax holidays, zero duties on computer imports, government incentives for venture capital, as well as a variety of programs for subsidizing technical education. Foreign reserves and foreign exchange reserves have consistently been bolstered by steady remittances from overseas. The 7 million strong Pakistani diaspora contributed some 11.2 billion US dollars to the economy in the fiscal year 2011. And these remittances have eased the pressure on the balance of payments brought about by the widening of trade deficit in the country. The above therefore suggests that if Pakistan can take advantage of its enterprise and resilience, the successful diaspora, as well as the opportunities offered by a growing South Asian regional economy, and overcome some of the challenges it faces today in politics, governance, and social development, it could set itself on the road to become the next economic success story. The many illustrious speakers that we have today will address these opportunities as well as some of the challenges 
and I wish all of you an afternoon of stimulating discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tan. May I now invite Mr. Karan Singh Thakura, Chairman of Singapore Business Federation, South Asia Business Group, for the opening remarks. Mr. Thakura, please. Excellence, Jeff Hassan, High Commissioner of Pakistan, Mr. Jasmine Anwar, Governor of the State Bank of Pakistan, Professor Tan Taiyong from the Institute of South Asia Association, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I'm honored to be here this afternoon to deliver the welcome remarks as the Chairman of South Asian Business Group under the Singapore Business Federation. On behalf of Singapore Business Federation, South Asian Business Group, I would like to express my appreciation to the Institute of South Asia Study and Pakistan University for organizing today's Future Pakistan Seminar. I'll just take away uh, five minutes of telling you what the SAPG is. South Asian Business Group was formed about two years back. After Network India was formed about seven, eight years back, we realized that in that part of the world, is much bigger than India. So with Singapore Business Federation, we have opened the SAPG. After having, uh, one day we are having dinner with uh, His Excellency Imran, we realized that we need to actually set up a business Pakistan. So we are seriously looking into it, and actually we asked Mr. Imran to join us and start a concept on doing a business Pakistan concept. With this, SBF will take a lot of lead, roam, and take a seminar on um, this in the future, and even taking Singapore business people up to Pakistan. This seminar is an excellent opportunity for Singapore companies to have a first hand glimpse of the economic environment and business opportunities in Pakistan. According to IE Singapore, Trade Pakistan was Singapore's 37th largest trading partner in 2011, which total bilateral trade between Singapore and Pakistan increased from 1.7 billion to 2.5 billion. A 50% increase in a clear sign of ongoing straight, strong trade between both countries. Pakistan has about 118 million population with a GDP of 160 billion. And a lot of opportunities in Pakistan. If you are looking at the Indian part, you will see just here, this is two, two twin countries. Uh, we need power, we need thermal power, we need coal, we need energy, we need gas, we need roads, we need infrastructure. On top, we need a trading companies who can actually both sides of the country by using Singapore as a hub. Besides benefiting Singapore companies in Pakistan, company operation in the region can also take this advantage for using Singapore to use going to Pakistan. Uh, how do we get to use the word? We, Singapore, should look in future to doing business in Pakistan in a bigger way. As we have a lot of Pakistan companies that have actually come over to Singapore in the last many, many years. You see. I have a good friend here, I've known him for 30 years. Uh, I'm not a good speaker, so I'm really sorry for this. Uh, and actually, I'd like to congratulate ISAS and Pakistan ICOM for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Takra. It is with great pleasure now to invite Mr. Shahid Javed Berkey, Visiting Senior Research Fellow of ISS, to deliver the keynote address on Pakistan's macroeconomic review and investment policies. Mr. Berkey, please. something for Pakistan and uh, I accepted his challenge and then uh, with the 
help of Imran and some other people. We began to work on this, and I'm delighted uh, that uh, so many people have come, obviously showing some interest to in the country uh, from where I come. Uh, as Professor Tanta Yong said, uh, although he called me a professional economist, and I thought professional economists were not yeah. supposed to be cheerful people, uh, but he said that I uh, end one of my three papers with some relatively cheerful thoughts. Uh, one thing I would like to start, say at the very start, is uh, the nations have their ups and downs. Uh, I have been in the development business for a very, very long time, close to 50 years. And I've seen many nations, many states go up. I've seen them come down. And then I've seen them go up again. Uh, more than 40 years ago, when I went to Harvard University, for my graduate work in economics. At that time, Pakistan was being taught as the model of success. Uh, the people who taught me economics, development economics, had also written about the Pakistani experience. And some of them had been involved uh, with, uh, with Pakistan. And the general consensus, and I'm talking about 1967 to 69, was that here is a country that has found a way to get out of economic backwardness, to climb on to a higher uh, trajectory of growth, and leave poverty, uh, bad income distribution, etc., behind. And there was a lot of excitement at Harvard, serious <coughs> people doing serious stuff, looking at Pakistan in a very serious way. That seems now a very, very long time ago. At this point, uh, Professor Tan Yong talked about my three papers. I start the first paper by saying that Pakistan is today's uh, sick man of South Asia. Uh, it is the least the rapidly growing economy in the South Asian continent. It is the one that has given the least hope for the future. There is despondency in the country. There is disappointment outside the country. And the current situation is such that not many people attach much hope uh, to this piece of land uh, in terms of looking at the future. I happen to have a session with President Zadai a few months ago. And he asked me, he said, what do you think of Pakistan? Where are we going? And I said to him, I said, Mr. President, I think you are the sick man of South Asia. So he was a little taken aback. And he said, why do you say that? I said, because you are growing at a rate of 3 to 3.5% a year. Bangladesh is growing between 6.2 to 6.5% a year. India used to be growing at about 8%, now it's come down to about 5.5 and so on. So I said, just take a look at these numbers. You are not doing what other countries are doing. He gave me an interesting response. Uh, he said, uh, you're comparing apples and oranges. And I said, no, Mr. President, I'm comparing the apples with apples. The difference is that we are the rotten apple in the basket. <laughs> he said, no, you misunderstood me. What I meant was that India has had democracy for 65 years. Bangladesh has had off and on democracy for 30 some years. And the way Zadari talks, he personalizes everything, and he said, I have had democracy only for three years. And give me the chance, and I will show you that using democracy, I will turn the country around. So that's his vision. Uh, my own vision is that, and that includes uh, Mr. Zardari's government, that the country has the potential uh, to grow, 
It has the potential to provide for its people. Uh, it has human resources, which are reasonably well developed, uh, to bring the country into the modern age. But what it lacks are two things. It lacks good governance. And that's where Zardari and his team comes in. And it also lacks the ability to raise its own resources to finance even the small amount of investment that the country is making in its economy. Which means that because of poor governance, there is uh, unpredictability, there is corruption, transaction costs have become very high. Uh, Pakistanis themselves have calculated that the incremental capital output ratio for their country is nine. Now let me just tell you what that incremental capital output ratio is. It's a very simple concept, which I learned as an undergraduate. It is the amount of investment that you do in an economy, the proportion of GDP that you invest in an economy to produce 1% increase in, the, in, in GDP or in the national income. So the more you invest to get 1% increase, obviously less efficient the economy is. Generally speaking, countries have i of about 3.5 to 4. Pakistan has 9. And so the one thing that has to be done is to bring the i down so that you can have a higher rate of, uh, uh, rate of return for whatever capital is being invested. Pakistan says very little. Uh, tax to GDP ratio is only of the order of about 8.5%. Singapore, I believe, is about 22%, uh, which means that the public services cannot be financed, uh, roads cannot be built, ports cannot be built, and a whole lot of other things that uh, a functioning economy needs, needs to be done. Pakistan. Other problems are well known. There's the security problem. There's the rise of Islamic extremism, uh, which has uh, created a scare. People don't want to invest in the country because they don't know what will happen to their capital. So money is flying out of the country. I am told, this is anecdotal, maybe the High Commissioner knows about this, that there is a lot of flight of capital from Pakistan to Malaysia to Singapore to uh, UAE and some other places. So in sum, uh, the current situation is not good. Where do we go from here? Uh, obviously, two or three possibilities. One is that we continue to muddle along. We continue to go from one crisis to another, one difficult situation to another, and we stay on that kind of path. The other one is that Pakistan becomes an even more dysfunctional place than it is today, and begins to lose even the little bit of uh, economic momentum it has, and becomes uh, something like uh, one of the not well-performing countries in Africa. The third is, and I'm going to focus on that now quite a bit, that there is a possibility that the country can pull out, that the country can pull out of its very serious situation. Now let me, uh, let me say the following and say it with a great deal of emphasis that poorly performing countries that have performed well in the past can be turned around very, very quickly. Uh, I don't know if there are any Indians in this audience. Uh, India was performing very poorly for about 40 years, from 1947 to about the middle of 1980s. Uh, there was an Indian economist who used to sit next to me uh, at my office in the World Bank. His name was Raj Krishna. He coined the phrase, the Hindu rate of growth. 
and the Hindu rate of growth was put down at 3 to 3.5 percent. Pakistan at that time was growing at about 6 to 7 percent, twice as much. India brought in reforms. India had good, high quality leadership. And within two, three years, the Indian rates of growth doubled. Another three, four, five years, Indian rates of growth tripled. What happened was that there was capacity in the economy. There was capacity amongst the people to apply themselves and make use of the economy to increase the output. And India bounced out of this so-called Hindu rate of growth to uh, very reasonable rates of growth coming close to uh, that of some of the East Asian countries. When I worked at the World Bank, uh, my last job at the bank was, uh, I was in charge of Latin America and the Caribbean. And by stroke of luck, I arrived uh, in that region when a number of countries were just going down very fast. Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru. Uh, I saw that with good policies, with dedicated leadership, these countries could and did turn around. And the turnaround took place very quickly, within a matter of years. So it is my strong belief that Pakistan has the resources, human, physical, location. Pakistan has an extraordinary location. If uh, politics doesn't get in the way, there is no reason why Pakistan should not allow the flow of Indian goods and commodities from India to Afghanistan and points beyond, why it should not allow uh, China to trade with the Middle East using Pakistani space. So Pakistan, because of its location, can become the center of uh, international commerce. And obviously, if it were to do this, it wouldn't do it free. It would charge transit fees and so on and so forth, and could edit could add enormously to the economy. Uh, so there are things that can be done. Now, what is it, uh, concretely speaking, what is it uh, that the government needs to do in order to realize some of this potential? Uh, what I've been talking up to now are some vague ideas, but it is important to translate weakness into some concrete stuff. My own view, and I've written about this uh, in several places, is that economists tell us that nothing matters more than confidence amongst the people. It is only when people have confidence in the economy that they invest in the economy. If they don't have confidence in the economy, then they don't invest in the economy, they send their money out. And there is a healthy uh, flight of capital taking place from Pakistan to places outside. As I said earlier on, Singapore, Malaysia, and so on and so forth. My view is that if a government comes into power, if those who hold the reins of power come up with a credible strategy for growth and divide it into two parts, the immediate and the medium term, you will be surprised as to how much confidence that will bring back to the people. People will say that finally we've got leadership, we've got economic managers who understand the problem, prepare to do things, let's not invest outside, let's keep the money inside. I have worked in this area for a very, very long time, and I know that domestic capital earns much more in the domestic environment than it does when it escapes and goes out some other place. So if that confidence develops, people who've taken the money out will take, bring the money back. I have done some very rough back of the envelope exercise. And uh, uh, by the way, I did write up a paper, short paper, and if you are interested in what I'm saying, it's lying somewhere outside. And there's a table in that in which I have 
uh, identify what various policies would reduce in terms of uh, rates of growth. My view is uh, uh, that the return of capital could add two percentage points uh, to, uh, to the rate of growth in investment, and using an incremental capital out of ratio four, this means that Pakistan GDP could increase by 0.5 percentage points in a period of about three years. And then I have other increments on which, to which I will go. The short term, in order to create confidence, needs two or three other things. Because of corruption and stories of corruption, and the feeling that uh, you have to pay bakshish or pride and uh, safarish and so forth to get things done, that adds enormously to, to the transaction cost of businesses. If you're able to reduce those somehow, uh, that would also increase the confidence of the people. And my suggestion is that uh, Pakistan should have, Pakistan does have something called uh, National Accountability Bureau, NAP, that the <coughs> leadership of that should be appointed the way this government has appointed the leadership of the election commission, which is that the leadership is not responsive to any particular group of people, but has been chosen uh, through consensus. And if this, this kind of leadership can be selected and given long-term tenure, they have their own investigative agencies and so on, and if they can go after people who are obviously corrupt, making an enormous amount of money, getting after them, getting some money back, et cetera, et cetera, would add to, uh, add to the confidence. Uh, confidence. Finally, uh, in the, amongst the short-term thing, uh, Pakistan really has to address the energy problem. Uh, it is not unique to Pakistan. I happened to be in Delhi when uh, India went black. Uh, so uh, these things are complex things to manage. Uh, grid systems and so on and so forth. Uh, there are two points of view in so far as the energy sector in Pakistan is concerned. There are engineers who tell us that there is plenty of uh, electricity being generated. It just doesn't get transmitted and distributed because of the failure of the systems. There are people who say that no, generation is not enough and you have to increase generation. Again, uh, if I may refer to my Latin American experience, I did with a few countries where there were uh, serious short-term shortages. And these were taken care of very quickly. World Bank provided money, expertise, and so on. There are ships that are floating around all over the world that have power stations located on them. Uh, they can be brought in, uh, rented, plugged into the system. And I remember working on Dominican Republic uh, doing some, something like this. And within a matter of months, that particular problem was resolved. So there are, there are things that can be done. Let me uh, come to the, uh, but before I do this, uh, my arithmetic tells me that if Pakistan's structural growth rate <laughs> is of the order of about 3.5% increase in GDP a year, a short-term program can be easily developed on the lines that I have indicated, which would add another three percentage points of growth to the GDP in three years, almost double it. 0.5% will come from just increased confidence, bringing in more capital and so on. 1% from uh, energy shortage. 0.5% hopefully in measures taken to improve the security situation. 0.5% in terms of uh, improved trade with India. Uh, and then uh, I have a list of positives on to which I will uh, go a little later. That would add another 0.5%. So it is not inconceivable for the country to have its great uh, rate of growth go from 3 to 3.5% to about 6.5% in three years. But for the long term, this will need more work, and this will need much greater planning and so forth. I have, in the work that I've done for ISIS in the last few months, identified about half a dozen uh, what I call positives. 
And my view is, which uh, Yasin Anwar and his colleagues have not yet accepted, because they have not listened to me with the kind of seriousness that I think I deserve, that if they were to uh, include these thoughts in a, in, a, in a country strategy, they could add another two to three percent points to the rate of growth. Now, what am I talking about? Let me mention five or six, uh, what I call the positives. The most important positive is Pakistan's agriculture. Not many people know that Pakistan has the world's largest irrigated system. There is nothing that comes equal to it. The Americans have the second largest, considerably smaller than that of Pakistan. And yet, this particular system, built with enormous amount of expenditure, both by the British government and by the Pakistani government, produces low quality crops and low value added crops. So changing the cropping pattern, in, in <coughs> introducing higher uh, uh, value added crops, would add enormously to Pakistan's uh, output, uh, in Pakistan's agriculture output. The second thing that I included in my, uh, in my positives is that Pakistan always has had a very interesting, well-developed, small and medium-scale engineering industry. Those of you who know Pakistan know about Wazirabad, Gujarat, Sialkot, and so on. The economists have now come up with the notion of clusters, uh, which goes against uh, what economists think rational thinking would produce, which is not that people will cluster together and create all kinds of uh, bottlenecks. Clustering leads to better performance. And there are areas in Pakistan where this thing has begun to happen. And these areas are in a, around Lahore. Now, you tie this development of clusters with opening of trade to India. And what it will mean is that Pakistan can develop supply chains and link them up with industries in India and China. There is no reason why Pakistan should make automobiles. It has only a very small market, market for them. But it has, and I have been to some of those. <coughs> it has some very decent uh, component manufacturing companies in this area that I'm talking about, which is Mala Sialkot and so on. So chains can be built which will supply parts and components to the very large Indian auto industry, very large uh, China auto industry. And so Pakistan, that way, begins to link itself with other parts of the world. My fourth thing uh, surprises people a bit when I count it as positive. And that has to do with Pakistani women. The High Commissioner invited me to speak at a conference that he uh, had put together about uh, women entrepreneurs and so on. I have, again with the help of a couple of research people in ICE, has done some interesting analysis. Uh, I don't know how many of you know that at this point, something like 55 to 60 percent of the total enrollment in institutions of higher learning are women. So there is a majority of women in schools, in colleges and universities, and even a much larger majority of women in uh, professional schools, which means engineering schools, medical schools, dental schools, IT schools, and so on. I have estimated that something like one million women are coming into the workforce every year, highly trained, very motivated. I've been saying this, and my, uh, uh, my friends uh, from my gender don't like this. I say that I don't know why. Uh, maybe there are good anthropological reasons for this. Pakistani women are much better than Pakistani men. And these women are doing some wonderful job. They have uh, set up small small shops all over the place in fashion industry, in IT sector. Uh, Salim Ghori once told me that uh, there is an IT cottage industry that has developed. And it has been built around by women who are recently married and have to stay home with their computers. And they work for uncles and aunts and so on, sitting outside. So women are now coming in. 
They're coming into finance, they're coming into IT, entertainment industry, journalism, health, education, and so on. The world's largest school system is a Pakistani school system, in which a massive amount of investment has been made by uh, a venture capital fund. It's called Beacon House, and it is now in many, many parts of the world. And now they have set up a university. So, and that was done entirely by a woman. And now her daughters-in-law in are getting in, involved. Uh, Tanta Young talked about the Pakistani diaspora. That is also an amazing development about which we have not done enough work. My estimate is that we have about seven to eight million Pakistanis living outside the country, and that their per capita income is about two-thirds the total income of Pakistan. Their savings rate is higher than the savings rate of Pakistan. Uh, when I was at the World Bank, we studied diasporas. They, all of them follow the same uh, sort of spending pattern as they uh, grow and mature. Pakistani diaspora is now at a stage where they will be prepared to make investments in their own country, provided they, they can develop uh, uh, they, uh, they can develop confidence in the country's future. So these are some of the positives that should be built into uh, longer term. Uh, by, by long, I mean really medium term for the next three to eight years. And then the arithmetic that I've done is that this would add something like another 2.5% in terms of rates of growth to the Pakistani economy. So if, an, uh, and now we will hear more about some of the sectors where this kind of growth should be possible, but it is not inconceivable. It's not a pie in the sky kind, kind of thing. With intelligent policies, with honest and dedicated leadership, and with good association with the people getting their ideas worked into the strategies, it is quite possible, very possible, for Pakistan to go from the present 3.5 to 6.5 percent rate of growth in three years and to 8 percent in about eight years. And that is uh, what gives me hope. This message needs to get out. People outside Pakistan need to understand that here is a country of nearly 200 million people which has that kind of potential, which is now ready to go forward if things come together. Thank you very much.